Hello, I'm Dan Laren, and this is the case of the week. Today we're going to talk about another employee theft that took place here in our community. This case started in April of 2009 when the uh, accountant at a local auto parts company was contacted about a check that had been passed at a nearby convenience store. It turned out that this check had been written to a young man who was not a customer and who had never done any business at the, at the uh, company in question, but that the company check had been made out to him and he had cashed it. The management did an audit and they found out that one of their employees had created about 84 checks. This employee's name was Daryl Clift, and he worked in the parts department of this particular business. He had access to the computer system, the uh, accounting software that created checks, as well as invoices. And he used his access to these things to create 84 checks that were valued in, at over $22,000, which were in turn cashed by friends of his. The basic scam was that he would create a fake return from a return that had actually taken place, change the names in the, in the system, and have the checks made out. Uh, over half of these checks were cashed by a man at an out-of-town bank, and the other ones were cashed at various convenience stores here in Lexington. Uh, the financial crimes detectives investigated this case, and they charged Mr. Clift with theft by deception. Now, the case wound its way through the system. Ultimately, it took almost two years for the case to come to trial. There were various continuances because one of the main witnesses was in federal custody in South Carolina and they had to do a writ to bring him back. There were some other medical emergencies and so forth that resulted in delays. Ultimately, the case went to trial in June of 2011. And this was my case, so I, I prosecuted it. We called four witnesses from the, the company to testify about the checks and the paperwork. We called three people that worked at convenience stores who had cashed these checks. We called the out-of-town bank manager to authenticate the checks, about 55 of them that had been cashed by this other individual. And we called people that had actually endorsed and, and cashed the checks. And the way we found these individuals was that they were mostly in custody. One gentleman was in federal custody and we had to go get him from South Carolina and the other two were, were housed at the local jail. As the case went to trial, it took two days, and right before our prosecution's case was ended, the defendant changed his mind and pled guilty. He was ultimately sentenced to five years, put on probation for five years, and the judge ordered him to serve five months in custody. Now, the unique thing about this case, as financial scams go, it's, it's fairly standard, but Mr. Clift was offered three years in this particular case in August of 2009 and he chose instead to continue the case for almost two years and then plead guilty at the end of the prosecution's case. When you think about it, uh, it cost the Commonwealth over a thousand dollars to transport the, the individual from federal custody. He was housed at the jail, testified, and then he was returned. We had to pay for a jury to come in. That was almost $1,000 for the jurors to come in and then the panel to sit for two days. We took two days of the court's time. We took about 10% of the workforce of this particular company out of their office for a day so they could come testify. Had to bring in a bank manager who had to come in from out of town. We had to have the guards sufficient to uh, supervise the other witnesses. Altogether, it was a fairly pricey situation. And the reason that this is the case of the week is that had Mr. Clift accepted the plea offer in August of 2009, not only would his sentence have been served out or almost finished by now, but he would have saved the taxpayers of Fayette County several thousand dollars and two days of the court's time. The Constitution guarantees that every accused enjoys the right to a speedy trial and to a trial by a jury of his peers. And so there's no way that we can bill anyone else for that cost but it, it makes one think about the cost of doing business and the delays that seem to be typical here in the Fayette Circuit Court. I'm Dan Laren, and that's the case of the week.